everyone's very eager, very enthusiastic. You go to these labs, you see these cool videos and you know, great, uh, great technical support, a lot of amazing tools. But you know, if you don't spend a good amount of time developing the infrastructure um, and have a really you know, high level of commitment to this procedure, it can be really daunting, very painful. Uh, it can really create a burden on your clinic and OR life. So if you're gonna commit, I think it's good to commit, uh, commit hard to it. Um, the learning curve is definitely steep, and I think to some degree we're all still in the middle of that learning curve. We're experimenting with new procedures, and, and we're trying to, to kind of uh, expand the breadth and the, uh, the, the complexity and the, and the skill level of the, of the more basic procedures. But, um, you know, you're dealing with a joint where the joint capsule is, uh, is interdigitated with, with these, these very stout ligaments. They can be very thick. Um, uh, there's, there's limited mobility without capsulotomies, and for years, you know, uh, visualization was poor. The ability to uh, to to get a good diagnostic inspection of the joint was poor, and also, um, you know, our ability to treat that pathology was was poor because of the limited mobility. Sometimes the the path of anatomy is very subtle, um, and, and as we're seeing now from some of the some of the research coming out explaining why these procedures are failing, there's a lot of undiagnosed um, a lot of undiagnosed morphological alterations, things like borderline dysplasia. Uh, alterations in, in acetabulum proximal femoral version, um, more global morphology that a scope can't address, and uh, and, and Justin's going to go into a lot of that uh, a bit later. But you know, there's huge potential for for iatrogenic damage, and as as you go through the complications papers, um, you're going to see the most common things being iatrogenic uh, nephraxias, uh, palsies, and, and chondrolabral injuries. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, uh, you're you're in a um, you're in kind of an expanding market where every year new tools are coming out. Um, there's a different skill set that's involved. Uh, general sports, you know, sports medicine surgeons, arthroscopists, familiar with 30 degree scopes, are, are going to be um, kind of challenged with, with the use of a 70 degree scope for most of the most of the uh, interdepartmental work. Um, and, and you know, so 70 degree scope, you know, flexible tools. These are all uh, all technical technical challenges that you know I'd say. You know, when you're when you're first getting started and you're kind of feeling out whether you want to get want to, whether you want to jump into this, um, you know, general traction fracture fracture table is, is definitely sufficient to do this. But as you start to get a bit more advanced and, and, and desire more ability for dynamic examination, a good, um, a really high quality uh, hip distraction table is is is, an, is a must. So this is a part to the to the new um, Arthrex table that's recently been released and and we've used now for a bunch of cases with, with good success. Um, so I think you know John Chris Freddy may, has made this point a number of times that that a lot of people come into your clinic wanting a hip scope you know and, and hip, a hip scope is not a procedure it's just it's a it's a tool to facilitate a treatment and it's important that they know that uh, part of the goals of hip arthroscopy number one to establish that diagnosis to take those hip mimickers and and really isolate you know one or, or you know a fewer uh, isolated uh, isolated diagnoses to try to kind of treat the root. Um, joint preservation always, uh, management of bony impingement and the labral preservation we're seeing now, um, you know, more optimal results with, with repair versus debridement. And if debridement's not, uh, not possible, then possibly a reconstruction. Um, as I was mentioning before, I think it's important to really lay some crave with patients, spend some time helping them understand that if they have labral pathology, um, you, they've often seen multiple providers who have, who have, uh, who have led them to believe that their labral tear is the sole and only source of their pain, and if, if that tear is is repaired, then their pain will go away and they'll be you know, back to their you know, their Zumba and their uh, you know, Pilates and P90X, and, and that may not always be the case sometimes. So, um, you know, chondral lesions, uh, and and again, so limiting hydrogenic damage. I think when you're starting to do these in more volume, it's as important to um, to know who not who who to avoid operating on, or who to be extra cautious with operating on. Than, than to actually operate on. People that you're gonna run into trouble with early on are the people where there's poor, uh, poor potential for traction. And, and I think it was um, Tom Sampson who says that all the complications of hip arthroscopy are involved with either too much distraction or too little distraction. And so this is, you know, this is a guy who, uh, you know, he's tall, he may max out your table, he, he's gonna be heavy and he's gonna be, he's gonna be really tight. So there's, there's some tricks to optimizing your, your, your joint visibility in these kind of patients. But, um, you know, these, these young hyperlax females, they have a, a lot going on biomechanically. They're often hyperlordotic. They have a lot of pelvic aneversion. They usually have, you know, they have a 
low volume acetabulum, usually some proximal femoral version abnormality. So um, unless you, you really know what you're getting into, these are, these are probably not the, the ones to do early on, but you will see them quite frequently. Uh, uh, also, so, so dysplasia, I think dysplasia, we're seeing a lot of you know, iatrogenic subluxation dislocations, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis coming out. And, and I think what, what we're really seeing is we're just, we're seeing people that don't uh, have a good awareness for you know, borderline dysplasia, respect uh, for the capsule, judicious capsular repair or preservation. And, and um, you know, if you, learning to recognize borderline dysplasia, I think is one of the most important, uh, important things you can do. And not only because it helps kind of set, set the prognosis and the expectations for patients, but also if things don't work out. And John Plahizzi just came out with a paper uh, stating that the major major reason for failure in hip arthroscopy is unrecognized dysplasia. And, and so if they're aware that they may need a secondary surgery or a combined arthroscopy and PAO, um, it's not a surprise to them down the road if things don't work out. 50-year-old women um, and, and up is also, I think, a different population because you're, you, you know, they've all been diagnosed with labral pathology. The joint space is normally very well preserved. But when you get in there and look around, cartilage is very yellow and soft. They, they generally, some have had an early hysterectomy. There's you know, a lot of undiagnosed thyroid disease and a lot, a lot of metabolic insufficiency that goes on. You know, bone, subchondral bones getting soft. And you know, a hip arthroscopy for them may, you know, may be very uh, equivocal in its results. So um, that's kind of a special population. People with buttock pain, and, and Ben studied this and shown that people with, with buttock pain in addition to groin pain often don't do as well as, as people with primarily uh, groin pain. And obviously cases of uh, advanced degenerative changes. So your, your OR setup is, is huge. Um, you wanna make sure that as much as possible you have a consistent you know, coordinated team effort. And you know, early on you're gonna to wanna to be there for every positioning to make sure things are really optimal. But if you get a good team that, you know, that can facilitate your setup, You'll get to a point where, you know, within five or ten minutes, you can the patient can be in the room, set up, draped, and and you can you can walk in. Um, but that definitely takes a lot of time and commitment and infrastructure. Uh, we talked about fracture table versus hip distraction table. I think, with few exceptions, most people have adopted a supine approach to this. Um, there's lateral tables too, and that's kind of that's all based on your own preference. Um, anesthesia, you can you can easily get distractions with general anesthesia. Uh, with or without uh, muscular paralysis, um, I think more than anything, good deep sedation is uh, gives as much relaxation as as complete neuromuscular paralysis. It allows you to use LMA versus endotracheal tube. Um, we've had good results. We we originally started out using uh, lumbar plexus blocks because that's that's how I train, but we transitioned away from that because not as many regional anesthesiologists are as familiar. The complication rates higher. And you know now there's some emerging studies showing that a femoral block is is, is equally good and and more efficacious than, than general for post-operative uh, pain control. Um, padding on the feet is definitely important um, with with the compression with the traction. You can get into issues with uh, with iatrogenic compression injuries to the skin, even uh, recorded cases of uh, ankle fractures. Um, and so this is this is our general setup, and we usually position uh, the CRM on the opposite side of the. OR table um, with our uh, with our tower so that we can easily view it. Uh, we normally set up our instruments just um, to the to the patient's head side of the table. Our bath table is here, um, and we just we use a standard uh, shower curtain type draping scheme. It's, it's really quick. It's reproducible. Um, take pictures of your setup, especially your bath table setup. So if you have a, a scrub tech that's unfamiliar with your case, they're not fumbling around with what instruments you're going to use. Um, my my basic portal setup is is a, uh, a traditional anterolateral portal. I usually don't use an anterior portal unless uh, there's some kind of um, uh, you know, additional suture shuttling that needs to be uh, uh, managed. I use a modified or mid-anterior portal and a distal anterolateral accessory portal for peritrochanteric work. Um, you can use, if you get into trouble early on and, and you're not getting good visualization and you get in there uh, and everything's red, you can establish a posterolateral portal for outflow and that'll clear things up easily. So the new, so the new Arthrex uh, hip distraction table gives the ability to uncouple the foot from the distraction system, and, and gives a really good dynamic examination, and and uh, that's important when you're checking to see whether you've uh, completed a good femoral resection and you've you've increased their clearance. Imaging, um, 
you know, so so you want to make sure that the imaging that you're that you've achieved intraoperatively equals uh, is equivalent at least to the preoperative templating, so that you're you know you have your templating completed and you're accomplishing what you've set out to accomplish postoperatively. Uh, and this is you know Chris Chris Larson has uh, published this in Arthroscopy in 2009, um, kind of showing the importance of preoperative templating and how it relates to intra intraoperative um, imaging. You know, for me, um, if there's if there's signs that I, I need to do significant bony work. I, I almost always get a CT scan. It's, it's a, you know, we use um, radiation, redu uh, radiation reduction CT units. Uh, but for me, you know, and especially early on your learning curve, I, I think this has been invaluable for diagnosing subtle, subtle rotational variations. Really sit down with your, with your uh, radiologist and, and establish the parameters, what you want them to measure for you. Get distal femoral cuts. Um, you can see these these morphologic uh, subspine regions, these variations, and and sometimes large uh, large acetabular rim fractures, which may sh may change your treatment quite a bit. Um, so the leg position for me is is usually slight abduction or neutral abduction, with about 10 to 20 uh, degrees of internal rotation, um, just to a comfortable position. Usually with with men, you can't internally rotate as far. Women, you can internally rotate to 90 degrees if you wanted. Um, Slight flexion just to relax the anterior capsule and um, uh, abduction dependent on what you're going to do. If it's peritrochanteric work, you can abduct slightly to relax the IT band. Um, an internal rotation kind of brings that femoral neck more parallel to the floor. And uh, if you're going to use a posterior lateral portal, it reduces your chances of sciatic nerve injury. So the, uh, the leg position, the post is going to create both a distalizing and lateralizing vector, which is important to reducing kind of pressure on the perineum. Um, and that's, that's kind of the vector that, that you really want for, uh, for optimal access. So, so the way that I normally start the case is I counter traction the oper opposite limb to counterbalance the pelvis. Um, I, I normally apply a bit of fine, fine traction to the, to the operative extremity to make sure that there's no gross distraction, no gross disruption of the, you know, the uh, capsular integrity or labral seal. And if, and if it stays uh, congruent, <coughs> I normally will, you know, sterilely, before I even drape, I will uh, uh, introduce a 20 gauge spinal needle to vent the labral seal. You normally will see an air arctogram, uh, which allows fine you know, uh, controlled distraction rather than just cranking and cranking until the labral seal kind of breaks open, which is a little bit more traumatic. Um, this is Brian Kelly's uh, older study looking at all the different portals that you can use. And, and generally, as long as you're kind of in this, this area, you're, you're really in a, in a pretty safe zone. The only ways you can get into trouble are if you drop your hand too much with your entry portal and head to an anteriorly, you know, miss the joint altogether, um, or if you're establishing a posterior portal, you, you aim too posteriorly. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is, is one of the most common uh, sources of iatrogenic nerve injury, commonly in thigh numbness. Uh, ASIS here, um, and some of, the, some of the traditional portals here, so you can see really how close this is. So it's important that when you establish your portals, you use a just in size of skin, sometimes use a nick and spread method. Um, kind of blow through these a little bit, but this is these are the structures that you're going to be uh, you're going to be punching through when you when you utilize your arthroscopy. They're generally uh, between muscle fibers rather than uh, tendon <coughs> insertion, so uh, you don't normally run into issues with a lot of iatrogenic trauma. Um, there's a great Ben uh, uh, Ben published a great article on on technique for safe access in, in arthroscopy last year. And I think that's really, really good to avoid labral puncture and iatrogenic chondrolabral injury. Um, so I definitely recommend reading that. I, uh, so once, once I'm in, I normally insufflate the joint with about 20 to 40 cc's of saline. Um, under direct visualization, as John was showing in the video, creating a mid-anterior portal. And what you're going to see is this anterior capsular triangle, uh, which is iliofemoral ligament, anterior labrum, and femoral head. Um, yeah, and, and you know, you're expanding these capsulotomies with a beaver blade. You're trying to be judicious about how much capsule you take. Uh, I think a while ago we were a bit more, um, uh, bit more aggressive about how much capsule we were doing big capsulectomies and focal, uh, you know, focal, focal capsule resec uh, resections. But now the focus is with iatrogenic instability has swung back to preserving the capsule, you know, retaining it, repairing it. This is just a quick video of my usual access. So we're seeing, you know, again, that anterior capsular triangle. Um, I try not to, I think the, the uh, tendency early on is to really push the instruments deep into the central compartment, but you really don't need to be there as you're introducing these. Uh, 
uh, these cannulas, you can really stay just, just within the capsule. I like to advance the, uh, the beaver blade past the labrum as I pull the cannula out to make sure I'm not cutting the labrum inadvertently. Um, so now I've switched, I'm viewing from my mid-anterior portal, looking back at my original anterolateral portal. Uh, in this case, I'm connecting my capsule, my capsulotomies. So you can see kind of with a sweep of the beaver blade. I think there's like, there's basically two, there's two kind of segments to the capsule. There's a deeper synovial part and a more stout external part. I, I'll usually develop this extra capsular space a little bit. There is like a, a true space outside of the capsule. You think about it like an open joint surgeon. Um, and you can develop that space and it allows you to retain more capsular tissue to repair at the end. So you kind of, you have to, you, you're sort of obligated to, to remove some of that deeper capsular tissue around the labrum for, for intercapsular work. Um, but you can usually keep the, uh, and that's, that's the direct head of the rectus right there, which is a, a good landmark. This is through a directly anterior portal. I'm showing here that this would be a poor portal for placement of anchors. Um, high chance of punk, punching into the joint. And, and, and so now with an established interportal capsulotomy, good capsular retention, uh, you can get all, the, get all the work done you need. So, so again, so just in summary, I think um, it's important to, before you, you get in and you start to, to work in the joint technically, to learn to understand these morphologic uh, variations in version, um, to really be able to have a good understanding so that you can advise the patient on, uh, on proper prognosis. Um, and you know, recognition, as we'll, we'll mention a lot of times, of athletic pubalgia, tumor, spinal pathology, uh, and, and this trend now for judicious capsular management. Um, in some cases, patients are older, uh, capsule is very thick, hyperemic, injected, and they're a bit arthritic. Sometimes leaving the capsule open or capsular resection may be therapeutic. One thing to recognize, you're going to see a lot of lateral hip pain, and, and as Ben was mentioning, this was formerly, we used to think of this as simply bursitis, but I think that's kind of a vast oversimplification. Um, and if you're not feeling good about the case, if the indications aren't there for you, you know, you can, you can always say no. So again, a plug to the International Society of Hip Arthroscopy and the American Hip Institute. Great, um, great resource for patients and for, and for you as a surgeon, great videos. You're learning, you want to see how things should look, that's a, that's a great tool.